you have your Bible, turn with me please to Revelation chapter 2. It's a message that God laid upon my heart. And it's a series of messages really. But today I want to deal with just one in this series. <clears throat> and the title of this message is <clears throat> Return to Your First love. Many people are straying away and forgetting what it means to love God. And so the Lord laid this upon my heart. I had to be in Virginia on Friday, travel Thursday morning. Yesterday got back into Miami at about lunchtime and I had about seven hours wait for the next flight to Trinidad. And I thank God. It wasn't boring. When you use your time with God, it will never be boring. So I was uh, praying and typing my message, doing a lot of work, so it was fulfilling for me. But I'm glad to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't be there on Friday night for the half-night prayer meeting. I thank God for Reverend Ronnie and all the others, Minister Larry and all the others who manage it well. <laughs> Revelation chapter 2. <clears throat> The Bible says, to the angel of the church of Ephesus. The angel there means the leader, the pastor. These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience, and have labored for my name's sake, and have not become weary. Nevertheless, now this changes everything here. That one word, everything was sounding good at, up to that point, right? But now Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. Now, you know what I love about God, what I love about Jesus? Jesus will tell you and commend you about all the good things you have done. But if you are in sin, Jesus will not pretend that you are not in sin. You know, some people just like to be positive. And tell you all the nice things. And they know that you are on your way to hell. But they will never tell you, hey, you need to straighten up. That's not true love. Jesus says, remember therefore from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works. Or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place. Unless you repent. But this you have. That you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an heir, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Return to your first love. Haven't been saved for over 40 years. I am convinced that the most important thing in our Christian life is not the gifts and talents we have or the charitable things we do. It is not even how much ministry we are involved in or how much knowledge of the Bible we have. We certainly need all of these things that I've mentioned, but most importantly is loving Jesus Christ. With all our hearts and having a continual, passionate, growing love for Him. You see, it is easy to start off with genuine love and desire for Christ. And so many of us have started off. But somewhere in our spiritual journey, some of us lost our passion and our zeal for the Lord. We once were excited to be in the house of the Lord. But now it is no longer important. 
The worship songs were once so meaningful and uplifting, but now it is just a song. We have forgotten what it means to hunger and thirst after God. We have forgotten what it means to pant for the Lord Jesus as the deer pants for the water brooks. The church at Ephesus was guilty of losing their first love for Jesus. And now Jesus sends a letter to them telling them that he is hurting. He is grieved. He is disappointed that after all he had done for the church at Ephesus, the one thing he wanted from them is their love. And that is what they forsook. He calls them to return before it is too late. He commends them on many good things that they were doing. But he is so displeased about them losing their first love that he tells them if they don't repent, he will come and judge them. Now before I get into my message this morning, I wonder if Jesus were to write a letter to our church, what would he say? Will he be pleased with each one of us? Would he say you are doing just fine and I'm so satisfied with you? Or would he say I am disappointed that some of you have left your first love and many other things have taken precedence over me. I am now in the sideline. I was once the object of your love, the object of your desire. But now you have put me on the back burner. The church at Ephesus had first love at the beginning. This church was a very influential church which was established by the Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 19, we read of the successes that Paul had in winning souls and proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. But that's not all. We read of the persecution that Paul had to go through when he preached at Ephesus. He established this church and he put Titus as the pastor of that church. But this letter that was written in Revelation was written about 30 years after Paul established the church. At Ephesus in Acts chapter 19, he prayed for those believers who did not yet receive the baptism with the Holy Spirit. And after he prayed, they were filled. It was at Ephesus that he casted out demons. And the seven sons of Sceva saw what was happening. And they tried to do the same things. And the demons said to them, Paul we know and Christ we know, but who are you? And those demons proceeded to beat the sons of Sceva and left them wounded and naked. If you don't have the anointing, even demons will know it. You can't fool the devil. You can't fool demons. If you ain't got it, they're going to beat you and they're going to leave you naked. If you are not called by God and anointed by God to deal with these kinds of things, do not play super spiritual. Now after this incident, the Bible says many of the magicians and the witch doctors, they got saved. And brought their magic books and they burned them in public. And the cost of all these books, the Bible says, was 50,000 pieces of silver. That would literally run to hundreds of millions in our currency. But they burned it publicly. What were they doing? They were giving a public testimony to Jesus Christ. And they were no longer ashamed to call Jesus Lord and Savior. They burned the books publicly to let the society know we are no longer magicians. We are no longer witch doctors. We are now children of the Most High God. You see, when you have been radically saved, you will not be afraid to proclaim it to the world because you know you have what the world could not give you and what the world cannot take away from you it was in Ephesus also that God did special miracles to Paul that pieces of cloths from his body were taken to the sick and they were healed now it is unfortunate 
that some have misinterpreted this passage. And they have begun selling prayer cloth to people now. That's happening right in our country in several churches. I do not despise and I cannot put a limit on God. I'm not saying God cannot work through a prayer cloth today. I'm not saying that at all. God is sovereign. But this passage certainly does not mean starting a business with prayer cloth. One person, uh, not far, well, to the west of us in the city, they sell you something to put in your car, to put in your house, to carry in your bag, to protect you. And I'm talking about a well-known Pentecostal church. They call it a god. Apparently, they did not read the word of God that no weapon formed against you shall prosper. They did not read that a thousand shall fall at thy side and ten thousand at thy right hand, but they shall not come nigh thee. They did not read that he that is in you that is, great, is greater than he that is in the world. I don't need any God. That comes from other mystic religions. I have Jesus Christ. I don't need a God. And they are selling these things to people. And gullible Pentecostal Christians are buying it, hoping that the God would save them. What you need is to live a holy life. And you don't have to worry about a thing. And you can buy all the gods in the world. It can't protect you from the judgment of the Almighty God. In the midst of all these great miracles and successes, there was a great riot in Ephesus. And the city rose up against the Christians. Demetrius, who was a silversmith, he got angry because of what Paul had just done. And he gathered the other silversmiths and he said, we are losing our profits because of the gospel that Paul is proclaiming. And these Christians are also preaching against Diana, the goddess of Ephesus, we've got to do something. And they got it in a theater there in Ephesus. And a big uproar started. And they wanted these Christians out of their city. At this time, Paul was staying with some believers in Ephesus. And he begged them. He said, please let me go and face this crowd. And the believers held him back. They said, Paul, please don't go. He said, I don't care how hostile the crowd is. I don't care if I'm beat, beaten. I don't care if I'm persecuted. I want to go. I hear a lot about apostles today, but I wonder how many apostles are willing to die for their faith. How many apostles are willing to go through persecutions? Instead, you are hearing the apostles today. I'm going to buy a jet plane. Everything is just about money and prosperity. When I look at the life of Paul, he was truly a real apostle. The man had one passion to love Jesus and to preach the gospel of Jesus. And this amazes me how this apostle was willing to face a hostile crowd to tell them Jesus is Lord. Not everybody who carries the name is ready to face persecution for Christ. In fact, Jesus commended the church at Ephesus and he said, I commend you that you tried those who call themselves apostles and you found that they are not true apostles. I want to think about this. In the midst of all these struggles and opposition, the church at Ephesus, they remain strong in their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They did not waver or become discouraged. One thing for sure, they had an insatiable passion for Jesus. They had a desire for Jesus. They loved the Lord and they literally hungered for Him. There was a yearning in their hearts for God. They wanted more of Him. They knew what it was to wait in His presence and to feel the joys of intimacy with God. C.C. Winan sang this wonderful song. I want more, more, more of you. Jesus, I need 
need more and more of you and the beauty of the Lord Jesus is the more you have of him is the more you want you can never have enough of Jesus but I'll tell you this there are many Christians who don't want more of Jesus and you know why <clears throat> the more of Jesus you have is the more stuff you've got to give up so they say, Lord, I ain't ready to give up that stuff. How many people have been struggling with sin for a while? And the struggle is only because you don't want to give it up. So we pretend that we can be so religious. And we can be so pious. And the religiosity and the piety will overshadow the secret sins. Jesus is watching you. It is this kind of excitement and exuberance we had when we first accepted Christ. Does anybody remember when you first accepted Christ? Nobody had to tell you today's church. Does anybody remember? You remember when from Saturday you were started getting ready for church on Sunday morning? Does anybody remember? Do you remember when you had that fiery love for Jesus? That, you know, bubbling joy inside of you for the Lord Jesus Christ. What happened? Do you remember how you just couldn't get enough of him? Does anybody remember how you would be anxious in the house of the Lord? Do you remember how you could not wait for next Sunday? There was a joy bubbling inside of you and you were very happy to talk about Jesus. Everything was about Jesus. Now, you hardly mention his name. Back then, your smile was different. You had an anointed smile back then. Do you remember that, what that was? The way you talked to other believers was different. You did not complain to do anything for God. It was joy unspeakable and full of glory. But something happened. You have left your first love. Jesus is not so exciting to you again. Something has taken his place. You have faith in him. But you no longer have a passionate love for him. Your love has gone cold and you don't care much about any deep feelings for Jesus Christ we are human beings who are driven by our feelings we are emotional beings on Friday I had meetings with some professors from Liberty University was happy to meet Dr. Ed Henson you would have seen him on TBN and he will be here in Trinidad next year. I sat and had a wonderful meeting with him. And they are Southern Baptists, so they are not Pentecostals. But we sat there and we got into talking about worship. And both professors said, we don't know why our Baptist people are afraid to express themselves. They were telling me that the Pentecostals have it right. We've got to praise God and love God with all our feelings, with all our desire, with all our strength. When you come to worship God, put all your emotions into it. Now, many people can just worship and it's just a show. But there are those who when they worship, it comes from deep within. Don't answer me, but which one are you? I don't want anybody else to know. That's what I tell you to answer me. You tell God. <laughs> but this church now lost their first love. This was the state of the church at Ephesus. They began with great fervor and commitment to love Jesus and they were enjoying him. But they strayed away. They were not loving Jesus as they did before. They were focused on something else. This is the church that Paul established, as I said, 30 years before. And they were, they were living in such fiery love for Christ. But it faded away. Nothing is more important to me, saints of God. And I want you to listen to me carefully. At 
absolutely nothing is more important to me in this life than to love this man from Galilee. To be honest, I just can't get enough of him. Do I have a witness here this morning? I said, I just can't get enough of him. Every day I want more of him. All oh, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Paul says, for to me to live is Christ and to die is more Christ. Paul was saying, every day for me is just to have more of Christ. And I'm excited that whenever I die, I will have so much more of Christ. If that is not your passion, you don't know what it is as yet to really have an intimate relationship relationship with God. You see, we are so stuck in a Sunday morning service where we experience the presence of God and we leave the presence of God here and we go back home and come back hoping to pick up the presence of God again. But the church has got to come to a true revival that when you leave church on Sunday morning, you leave with the presence of God. On Monday, you have the presence of God. On Tuesday, you are praying and seeking God. On Wednesday, you can feel his presence surrounding you that's why the devil comes during the week to tempt you the devil has a little common sense you know don't underestimate him Paul said that that's why we have to be vigilant you think the devil is going to come here now to tempt you the presence of God is too strong here the word of God is being proclaimed. But he watches you. And the devil knows if you're carrying the presence with you or if you left it at the door. Jesus, you can wait right here. See you next week. Same time, same place. The church straight away. <clears throat> And so they lost their love for Jesus. Now the saints, at, according to Revelation chapter 2 at Ephesus, did everything right and committed. They were very committed to sound doctrines and they were careful about those who called themselves apostles. And after they examined these so-called apostles, they found them, to, found them to be false and simply imposters. Now, Jesus commended them on not being led astray by these false teachers. That means that Jesus expects us to examine people to see if they are speaking the truth and to ensure that we are not carried away with false doctrines. I mean, that's another subject for me. That's another sermon altogether. But so many false teachings are floating through our churches today that it literally amazes me. One bishop gets on the radio and he says that the first book of the Bible is really Job and not Genesis. And yes, Job was written before Genesis, but the events of Job did not take place before the events of Genesis. It was just written before. He says, therefore, the model that God has for the church is not Genesis because Genesis is just about a fall. He says the model that God has for the church is Job to be wealthy and to have in abundance. I don't know why he stopped short. He should have continued that that same Job lost everything. But he never lost his faith in God. <laughs> we have many apostles and prophets today that are going around with so many false doctrines. I remember some couple of years ago, a lady called me. I don't know the lady. I don't know where she's from. She calls me and she said, hey. God gave me a message for the churches. And I want to come to your church on Sunday morning to give the message to the church. I said, are you mad? Did you take your tabs this morning? Notice, Jesus sent the message to who? He sent the message to the angel of the church at Ephesus. And the angel, angelos in the Greek there, means the pastor, the leader of the church. God ain't going to send somebody strange to speak to my church when he has placed me here. God will talk to me. And I'm not a bastard. I know I'm living and dwelling in the secret place of the Most High God. I'm not going to let some strange person come and say they have a word from God. 
If we don't protect our pulpits and if we don't protect the true doctrines of the word of God, we can easily be led astray. We've got to do like a church at Ephesus and be very discerning. Now with these believers at Ephesus being so discerned and so careful about doctrines in the church, one would wonder how is it that they lost their first love. Let me give you some scenarios why people lose their first love. Number one, a loss of inward passion. Passion is something that you have to keep alive. You know, I was just thinking the other day, and I, I think the man would agree with me this morning. You ever realize in courting, a man has to do everything? He has to buy the flowers, he has to buy the chocolates, and he has to pay for dinner. <laughs> At least there are some ladies who agree with me. And he also has to be the first to text. And if a day passed and you didn't text, I'm sorry for you. <laughs> What's the point? The man carries the responsibility to keep the love alive and vital and always to remind this young lady, hey, I love you. I'm so intoxicated with the radiance of your beauty. I don't ever want to get sober again. <laughs> I can't live if living is without you. <laughs> and all the wonderful lyrics what is he doing? He is keeping the love alive and vital. Women are so fortunate. They are only recipients. I thought the man would have said amen now. Since the beginning of time, women have been drawing everything from men. All right, let me go on. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but because you want to keep that love vital, you do stuff. Amen? When it comes to God, how is it we forget all about that? You know what the Bible says? The first commandment is this. That we are to love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our might, and with all our strength. Nothing is more important to God than our genuine, unfailing love. The Bible says we love Him because He first loved us. But listen to this. Loving God is not automatic. It is a fire that you have to keep kindling. You may have started off well, but somewhere in the journey you grew cold. And anytime your love for God grows cold, everything else becomes peripheral and you are negligent about them. You don't care much about them. Why? Because you don't have that fiery passionate love for God. And this morning if you don't have that, come back. Return to your first love. Say, God help me to yearn for you like I used to yearn 20 years ago like I used to run after you God I know what it is to be flat on my face and to cry for you but I've strayed and I'm coming back I'm running back to you once you had a passion for the presence of God but now your greatest passion is the presence of the television once you can feel God in your midst, now you ain't feeling anything. Once God was the priority in your life, now he has become second place. David said, God, don't take away your spirit from me. Now, <clears throat> secondly, what causes us to lose our first love is engaging in sinful practices. Now, let me preface this section with this statement. Sin is no longer a big subject in the church today. Hell is not a big subject again. 
In fact, if you listen to <clears throat> some renowned preachers in the United States especially, um, there was a guy who was called Mr. Pentecost, great influential preacher, but he has backslidden and now he is saying nobody can go to hell because God loves everybody. <clears throat> he says, God is too loving for anybody to go to hell. One of the largest churches in America, you can listen to them on TBN, on YouTube, wherever. <clears throat> they are somewhere in Texas. He says we must not preach about sin. One local bishop said on radio recently <clears throat> that preaching about sin is wrong and those who preach about sin, they themselves are not saved and they are going to hell. I wish I meet him in person and I'll tell him I do preach against sin. I was a sinner but I'm saved and I'm preaching righteousness now. And I know where I'm going. You better check yourself before you don't make it. <laughs> but you see, we pretend that everything is okay. And we're not going to talk about sin because we don't want to offend people. Paul says this is called the gospel of offense. Jesus says many will hate you for my name's sake. He says if you are ashamed of me before men, I will be ashamed of you before my father. We have to tell people if they are in sin, we have to tell them that they need to repent and get out of sin. John tells us in 1 John chapter 3, sorry, chapter 2 verse 15. John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Now, he's talking to believers. He's not talking to unsaved people. That means it is possible for believers to love the world. But he says, don't love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now you can understand why some churches have confusion and conflict and there are problems. Because if believers don't have the love of God in them, they are not going to have right relationships with one another. Now hear me carefully this morning. Going back to sin will always drive you away from God. You cannot live in sin and love God at the same time. Can I say that again? Thus saith the Lord. You cannot live in sin and love God at the same time. Some of us have allowed the pleasures of sin to rob us of the pleasures of God. James 1 gives us a bit of the science of sin. When he says here in let no one say when he's tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot te be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. God cannot influence you to sin. God cannot lead you into sin. God cannot tempt you into sinning. But here, James explained it. Look at it, verse 14. But each one is tempted when he... Don't blame the devil. Don't blame another Christian believer. Don't blame anybody. James says when he is drawn away by his own desire and when he is enticed. Now listen to me. Sin always comes in a glamorous way. When sin walked into the Garden of Eden, sin walked in with this beautiful creature. And got Eve to disobey God. The Bible says the devil comes as an angel of light. You think if the devil wants to tempt you, he's going to bring something that is so glaringly bad and sinful? No. You ever look at, it, uh, at the advertisements of cigarettes and alcohol? <laughs> they make the advertisements so glamorous. But they never show you what the cigarettes do to your lungs and inside and the cancer it can cause. They don't show you what the alcohol does, how families are broken up, how people and children don't have money, they don't have food, they don't have clothes because of alcohol abuse. 
They don't show you all of that. Sin dresses up. Men, sin has a shape. Sin knows what shape to take, what form to take. Sin came in the form of Delilah. And that great powerful man, Samson, did not take time to realize that this was sin drawing him away from God. He was enticed. Now, we've got to be honest. Every one of us, we've got to check our hearts and see if there's any lust there, any sinful lust. Because that is what sin will connect with. That's what the devil will connect with and draw us away from God. So James says, it is by your own desire and entice. Now, listen to me, young people especially. Adultery and fornication does not happen with a physical touch. It does not begin there. It begins with what is in your mind, what is in your heart. That is where it starts. That's why Jesus says, he who looks upon a woman to lust after has already committed adultery. Because once the desire is formed inside of you, it's easy to follow through. So what's the point? Keep your mind pure. It's a good time to touch your neighbor and say, keep your mind holy and pure. If we are drawn away by sinful desires and we are enticed, enticed means that the object has taken a hold of our hearts, our inner being. It captivates our emotions and our drive is just to fulfill our desire. That's what happens. Now, can I be real with you? My wife is right here. Don't worry. I've been faithful to my wife all through. <laughs> I've often tell the church and tell people I've had sex only with my wife and nobody else. <laughs> when we got married, we were virgins. Thank God, His grace. This month will be 34 years. But here's my point. You think I had not had temptations? But I have experienced those things. But you know what? First, I love God. And I said, God, I will keep this body as a temple of the Holy Ghost. And I will not allow sin to defile this body. Because I want God to live inside here. I want the Holy Spirit to reign in my life. So I'm not going to let sin have its way. I'm going to trample on sin. You've got to do like Joseph. Leave your court and run. You can always get back a court, but it ain't so easy to get back your integrity. Now, let me tell you what the Spirit of God is telling me right now. It's not in my notes, I can show you, but the Spirit of God just told me to say it. Some of you are playing games with sin and pleasures right now that God says you need to give up quickly. You play with a snake, one day it's going to bite you. Can I say this again? The Holy Spirit is, is impressing upon my heart to say this. Some of you are involved in sinful pleasures, sinful thoughts, sinful desires. God says you better give it up quickly. Before too late, too late is your cry. So James continues, and it says, then when desire has conceived, so are you with me? Are you seeing the, the development of sin? First, you are drawn away. So the first thing you ought to do is not be drawn away. And the devil is an expert in drawing people away. You think the devil don't know what kind you like? He ain't going to send the other kind. Young man, he ain't going to send a 65-year-old lady to tempt you. <laughs> Do 
The devil is smart enough to know what kind to send your way. And that's what he's going to do to draw you away. Because the devil knows how sexual immorality draws people away from God. Because you cannot be in sexual immorality and love God at the same time. Make up your mind. Either you serve God or you serve mammon. But you cannot serve God and mammon at the same time. This is a day set the Lord, a day of decision. God says, make up your mind. This day, whom will you serve? Will you serve sin or will you serve the almighty God? Thus said the Lord. Now when desire has conceived, notice James is using the analogy of a pregnant woman. First the seed through enticement, then desire has conceived. What is next? It gives birth to what? To sin. You cannot plant lime and reap oranges. You cannot plant the seeds of lust in your mind and reap holiness. That's why Paul says in Philippians chapter 4, 4, 4 to 8, he said, whatever things are honest, whatever things are pure, whatever things are just, think. Your Christianity is determined by what you are thinking. Can I say that again? If you measure your thoughts and you analyze your thoughts, you would know how spiritual you are. If your thoughts are only filled with lust and sin and enticement and doing the wrong things, then that is who you are because you are what you think. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So it's conceived and it brings forth sin. And the Bible says, when it is full grown... Sin brings forth death. Let me just spend a minute with verse 12, a verse that I love so much. And then I'll continue with my sermon. Verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. And then verse 30, Now let no one say, I'm tempted. But look at this. James is talking about two kinds of temptation. First he says, it's a blessed thing to endure temptation. But then he's talking about temptation in verse 13 in a negative sense. So it can be confused and if you don't understand it. But this is what James is saying. James is saying, there is a temptation that you must endure. That temptation is what comes from outside. Persecution, mockery, and people speaking ill of you. Don't like you because of your faith. Don't like you because you are of God. James says, endure that. But he says now, the temptation that comes from within our own flesh, he says, resist that. What happens today? We resist the temptation that God says to endure and we endure the temptation that God says to resist. I just got to reach this girl for Jesus. I need to go home by her to teach her the Bible. I don't know. I I, I think, you know, she's a good candidate. (laughs) She has some problems and, you know, I'm just going to counsel when our heart is disposed to sin, we will try to find all kinds of reasons to engage in it. <clears throat> Thirdly, what causes us to lose our first love? The love of filthy lucre. Paul says, the love of money. Now, it, it, he never said it is the root of all evil. I know we say that, that's wrong. It is a root. Of all evils. A root. If our hearts are now taken up with materialism. And all we are concerned about is making money. And how we can get the wealth of this world. If we are going only after these things. And aggrandizement. And possessing more and more. Then 
our love for God will decrease. You remember when the rich man came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said, well, keep the commandments. He said, I've done all of that. He said, okay, go and sell all that you have and come follow me. That young man did not know that Jesus was going to give him wealth untold. Wealth that would blossom in heaven. Wealth that would be more than what he ever had. And that young man did not realize that he would die and leave all the wealth behind and somebody else would inherit it and he would be in hell crying for eternity. The one thing he did not want to do is sell all that he had and follow Jesus. Now that does not mean that every rich person has to sell everything and come follow Jesus. It doesn't mean that. But Jesus knew that day that that man had another God. That man loved money more than loving God. And he was boasting, I've kept the commandments. But the very first commandment says, thou shalt have no other God before me. Have we made money our God? Is our money more important to us than our God? Do we protect our money so much that not even God can get in there? You know how many Pentecostals, that's one area the Spirit can't get control of? All right, just say ouch if you can't say amen. That's one area. Lord, touch me this morning. Lord, I need a fresh anointing. God, I want to feel you. God, bless my house. Bless my children. God, protect me in my going out and in my coming in. Oh, God. Oh, God, fill my life. But not this. Take full control, God. But not this. I'll tell you a secret. When you make God the God of your finances, you will be blessed so many ways. Financially, I'm talking about. Materially. What Jesus said. But seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Let me wrap up this message this morning. My final point. How to return to your first love. Look at, look at the scripture again. In Revelation chapter 2. Jesus tells them how they can return. Three things he tells them. Three things. One, remember. Two, repent. And three, repeat. He says, remember from whence you have fallen. Verse 5. Remember therefore from where you have fallen fallen. You've got to go back to that place when you used to enjoy God and enjoy His presence. You've got to remember when you would sing the songs of Zion and it would be meaningful to you. You've got to remember that secret place that you used to be with God. You've got to remember where you left off God. Might be five years ago, ten years ago, twenty years ago. I don't know. But God says you've got to come back right there. Look at the prodigal son. He had to come back right back to the home that he left. And then he was restored. So Jesus says, remember. Think about when last you had that intimate relationship with God. And go back there. Secondly, he said, repent. Repent in the Greek simply means a change of mind, a change of attitude, a change of behavior. You see, repentance is not simply saying, Lord, I'm sorry, forgive me. Repentance is that you demonstrate and you manifest now in your life that you are truly changed. True repentance means a true change in your life. When you repent, you say, God, I'm not going to live in that anymore. I'm not going to do that anymore. Repent. Why? Because think about it. If Jesus says, if you love me, you shall keep my commandments. And Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, you have left your first love. That it means somewhere they were not keeping his commandments. I want to ask you this morning. Are you truly keeping the commandments of the Almighty God? Can you lift your hands in sincerity 
with a clear conscience and say, God, to the best of my ability and your help, I am living for you. <clears throat> I'll tell you something. <clears throat> Sin for me is not simply in the acts and the things we do. Sin for me begins in just having a wrong thought, a wrong feeling, a wrong statement. Those are the things that bring conviction to my heart. And I go before God and I repent. So Jesus says, remember and repent. Now he tells them, repeat. Look at it. He says, do the first works again. Remember, repent, and repeat the first works that you did. What are these works? I was thinking about it. I wonder what Jesus was talking about. He certainly was not saying work for your salvation. But he was saying those first works. When you would put aside time to just be with him. You remember when you got up 4 o'clock in the morning just to serve, serve the Lord? And cry out to him. You remember those times when he would just put aside everything else to go in his presence. Do you remember the time when you would make sure and take up your Bible and you would read? Do you remember the time when you would stand against sin and you would resist sin and you would obey the Lord? Jesus says, do the first works again. Listen to me. Loving God requires discipline. You've got to discipline yourself and do like Paul. First Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24, 27. Paul says, I keep under my body. Now I can't keep under your body. And keep under your body there is really a mild translation. The Greek rarely says, I beat my body black and blue to bring it into subjection. Lest when I've preached to others, I myself should become a castaway. Now here's the thing. You've got to beat your own body. I don't know what's going on inside of you. You've got to know what is happening. God knows. And God says, do the first works again. Come back to me. He's calling you before it's too late. Don't let this day pass as God has spoken. Don't let this day pass and you don't repent and return to him. We all know what it is to really love God. Let us give him our all. Would you stand to your feet with me, please?